Welcome to Last Match Standing, the podcast where we review, relive, and rank the greatest wrestling matches of all time. As always, I'm Spencer. I'm Uncle Paul. And I'm covered in glitter. And we are coming to you with episode 69 from September 22nd, 1996 from the brand spanking brand new Core State Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for WWF In Your House Mind Games. It's the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels, defending his WWF championship against mankind. Yes? Hello, ladies. No, no, uh, no sir, you've been canceled. We, we're not <laughs> I heard 69. Oh, no, 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 no. This no. is actually 96. Yeah, Valvinus, get out of here. 1996. <laughs> we'll catch you at WrestleMania. <laughs> on commentary for Mind Games, we have Vince McMahon, for better or worse, oh, JR, worse. and Mr. Perfect. What? Yeah, how about that? <laughs> I completely forgot that he was on commentary in fall of 96. And yeah. he was absolutely perfect. perfect. And this is part one of what I'm calling... Our Hebner double header. Yes, that's <laughs> oh, right. Episode sixty nine and seventy, featuring a little bit of Earl, or is it Dave? Ooh, tune in to find <laughs> out. <laughs> I like how we pointed each other, made eye contact. Guys, we are so close to the midway point. I know of season four. It's been such a fun season so <laughs> far. I mean, just last, we, you know, our last episode, episode sixty eight, Toyota in a way incredible stuff i mean just to return to joshi paul you've got to be living oh. up to go from that oh. match to this one like this is basically your season it i know like. right <laughs> it's incredible yeah this is one that paul has been petitioning for for quite a while it's like uh, every time we talk about matches that that would be one of the greatest of all time paul says mind games i think whenever you we first sat down gosh almost three years ago now God, yeah to look at matches i think this was one of the short list that i said oh this is one you should look at absolutely absolutely and it's and it's not one that a lot of people necessarily go straight to uh but one thing that i think is important to note is we have a lot of Shawn michaels matches already covered we on this do. list, and we have several mick foley matches on this list and whenever you look at those catalogs and you talk to people about what are some of these the greatest matches that come to mind when you think Shawn Michaels, when you think Mick Foley. And, and it might be a sleeper, but I think this match is one of the greatest from either of these two. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think what I like about this one is when you ask people, oh, what's Mick Foley's best match? They will default to Hell in a Cell, even though it's not his best match. It's his most iconic moment. But as far as in-ring work, this might be one of the best things he's ever put together. I, I think it's going to be really, really hard to argue against that. And, 
you know, to say that this is one of Shawn Michaels' best in his career, and Landon, it. like you mentioned, in a career full of some of the best wrestling matches we've ever seen, speaks volumes. Especially when you look at these two guys, you know, sort of on their own. They're not one that, on paper, you think would mesh super, super well in the ring. So to be able to pull off what they did here at In Your House is really a, a, a special, almost lightning in a bottle type of feeling and type oh, of moment. And, and it's one that is in a year, 1996, that's obviously not the best year in wrestling, specifically in the WWF. No, it isn't. Um, there's obviously good stuff happening outside of that, but um, not, not a ton of ups, I would say. One really important aspect to think about whenever you're talking about this match is it sets into place some pro wrestling staples that we see pretty much almost every big match since. Yeah. And, and we'll get into those as they happen, sort of as we go into the breakdown. But, man, just absolute stellar work from these two in, in an important year in WWF history. I mean, 1996, you're talking the rise of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Mm-hmm. Oh, in, yeah. In, in this, on this show, at In Your House Mind Games, is when we get the famous Stone Cold, you know, you put the S in front of Hitman, and, and that's the opinion that I have of Bret Hart. Oh, right? Man. Like, that iconic promo is on this show. So, it's only three months removed from his win at King of the Ring. So, things, the guard is changing. Right? Yeah. I mean, the main event of WrestleMania this year was the Iron Man match. Right? So, we are in an absolute shift 1995 to 1997 WWF are two different worlds. Yeah. You know? Big time. Two different worlds. And I think what's very, very telling about that is, you know how we normally get the intro package for the show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like about three minutes. They only talk about the main event. Well, one of the things that I think is really important, I'm glad you brought that up, is is In Your House Mind Games. It's In Your House 10, by the way. Uh, and and a gr- it's a great example of WWF using the theme in your house pay-per-view as a storytelling tool, specifically mind games. And it works so well. Uh, having a concept to base your stories around and tie all of it together into one concept. Though I, I will say uh, it was a little strange seeing Mankind's mask on a skull next to everyone's name throughout the nameplates yeah. of the whole card. What's even weirder Not is, just uh, the main event. What's even weirder is the skull going like... <laughs> oh, That's time. a little George the Animal Steel you got going on. <laughs> over there. That's uh, pretty but, good. And I'm not sure if you guys watched the whole show, but uh, 96 Mind Games, this is where the world's strongest man, Mark Henry, makes his WWF debut. Oh. Against Jerry Lawler, yeah. by the way. With a um, backbreaker. Yeah, this will be a trivia question that I will miss in a future episode of Last Trivia Standing. I'm, I'm excited already. Uh, the point here for for me, though, is, Landon, you're absolutely right about mind games. It, it just fit with not only the main event, but obviously the final curtain match, Goldust and Undertaker, even if that was an underwhelming contest. Uh, it just, to have those two matches sort of, they built on each other. They were all part of the same story. And so it was really, really, really interesting. And and you you gave a new challenge to Shawn Michaels that would shift him away from being the basic babyface champion. And I think that's what's so, so important about this matchup with Mankind. And I do want to say that we, we mentioned that Paul is, you know, this was sort of a big push from you to get on this list, yes. this match. But it's also one that's been suggested to us by our listeners. It has a lot. Yeah. And so it's a good, good reminder that if you are a listener to this show and you have matches that you're like, man, I just can't, um, can't believe they haven't covered that match yet or I haven't seen it on a Twitter poll, reach out to us. Absolutely reach out yeah. to us. We've gotten some really cool emails and Twitter interaction lately. Um, so definitely do that. Lastmatchstanding at gmail.com. If you want to email us, you can hit us on Facebook or Twitter at lastmatchcast. Um, it's been really, really cool to get those match suggestions from you guys. And and it looks like, you know, as we sort of venture into the second half of season four here pretty soon, um, now's your chance. Like, now is your chance to follow along. Uh, and also, you know, you comment on our YouTube videos, subscribe on those. That's where we've also gotten a couple of good match suggestions. So any way you want to reach out to us, do it, because we want to do anything we can to make the rest of season four uh, special for you guys. And don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps out the show. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yes, yeah. and if you want to call me a crybaby, 
Do it. That, that's just, where. That's why we're here. Throw yeah. some stars up there. <laughs> uh, call whatever you want. This is such a very interesting point in pro wrestling history. Uh, Mick Foley has finally made it to the top of the WWF card. And staring across the ring from him is the red-hot Shawn Michaels, as we've already said, five months removed from his boyhood dream coming true in the main event of WrestleMania 12. But what I find interesting is that we are told repeatedly on commentary how this has been this amazing coming out party, this amazing title run, and it really hasn't been all that good. Shawn Michaels' title run was considered to be a bust. You think? Yeah. It's kind of hard to imagine, right? Given the the sort of how, how insanely over he was oh, with he was the over. crowd. But I think the problem with his title run is they didn't really have an opponent for him out of the gate when he won that belt. I think that's that's the really good point, right? Is in order to have a successful title run, you have to have credible challengers, and that's sort of what Michaels was missing. And, and that's he, he no fault get, of his own. And eventually, he did get him. Yeah, but like I think his first opponent after WrestleMania, he I think he made events with the British Bulldog International Incident. I mean, I'm not knocking David. I fucking love the British Bulldog, but they did not have any real beef with each other. Like, why are you? Why is Bulldog made of anything? It's part of the reason why Shawn Michaels, you know, when we when everyone looks back at his career, he's generally known as being a much better chaser than a champion. Oh, I agree. Right? And it's it's why when you come up with a list of the most WWE championships and world heavyweight titles and all of that stuff, Michaels isn't anywhere really close to the top of that list. No, I think he's three WWF titles. And I know he's won the world heavyweight championship. I think he's won the IC two or three times and then like a tag title. That's it. Yeah. You know, he was a Grand Slam champion in the first of those, right? He definitely has the accolades, but he's not the Ric Flair, the John Cena, the Rock, the Triple H, the Randy Orton, the Edge, you know. No, he, like, doesn't, he doesn't have a dozen world titles. No. And and part of that is because he missed a big chunk of his career. Like, that's probably safe to assume. But the other part of that is he didn't need the championships. Absolutely. You know, I, I 100% agree. Mm-hmm. Now, when he came back in 2002, yes, they gave him the world title for a month. <laughs> and then, I mean, he had title matches. We've ever reviewed a few and it was of a them. And it was a feel-good moment, right? It you was. Know, you wanted that for him. But uh, he never but, touched it again. But he never needed no. to. You know, he, he was able to go and tell these fantastic stories that have nothing to do with championship titles. Yeah. Um, speaking of championship titles, the day after he won that title at WrestleMania 12, April 1st. 1996, Monday Night Raw, Mankind enters the WWF, making quick work of Bob Sparkplug Holly. Oh. <laughs> the, <laughs> transitioning into a feud with The Undertaker. Yes, yeah, the main event was The Undertaker versus Justin Hawk Bradshaw. Oh, boy. That match ended with Mankind is attacking The Undertaker, puts on a mandible claw, lays him out. Raw goes off the air. That's how you debut a fucking character. Are you kidding me? I mean, and Foley, <laughs> did you, I mean, Foley actually would put himself into this mindset, like trying to figure out, okay, what is mindset, what is uh, mankind going to be? Where's he, where's his head going to be at? He would spend the night in an arena's boiler room sometimes, or, or maybe under the ring uh, for the first few months, just so we could get into that character's headspace. I mean, it worked. Absolutely he got insane. there. Uh, and so, yeah, the two would start kind of interfering in each other's matches until they booked that first ever Boiler Room Brawl, which, I mean, Paul could tell you about. I made you all watch it, <laughs> <laughs> and you all enjoyed it. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, it was it was definitely interesting, considering <laughs> in addition to escaping the arena's boiler room, you had to also... Uh, reach under the ring and take an urn from Paul. Be- what 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 the hell was that? Okay, the stipulation. They didn't they didn't mention this until after the match had started. Because the first time I watched it, I'm like, okay, they're brawling in here. There, there's an official and a cameraman, and then they leave, and then they start fighting in the backstage area. And Ben is mentioned. Oh, by the way, the first guy to get the urn wins. What? Oh, there's Paul Bear with the urn. <laughs> Not thrown together at the last minute or anything. No, I, well. 
I don't know if you guys know this. The entire backstage was all pre-recorded. <laughs> the boiler room brawl was all recorded. It, it's not live until they break into the locker room and come through the... That's all live. Everything in that boiler room was, was all shot on location. So I don't think they knew where the match was going to go <laughs> when they filmed it. They just filmed it. But you know what? Is it entertaining? Oh, hell Absolutely. yeah. Uh, but as a part of this... Uh, while Paul Bearer uh, is under the ring, there's some sort of plot twist, right? Because this whole time, since, what, 91, 90, whenever Undertaker debuted, yeah. Paul Bearer has been loyal to The Undertaker. They were together for six years. And all of a sudden... Paul Bearer's laughing! Paul Bearer's laughing! What's going on here? Oh, Paul Bearer smacks Undertaker the head with the urn and hands it to mankind and then starts laughing uncontrollably as he polishes the urn and hands it to his nephew. Uncle Paul. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah, it's just, it's one of those things you just can't imagine at that point Paul Bearer being separate from the Undertaker. So it's, to, to me, it's one of the most memorable moments uh, of mankind's career you know just that that moment that Paul Bearer turn is something that I think about um you know in terms of memorable moments and for it to happen you know sort of so soon after his debut into the WWF and yeah. uh, you know as part of that boiler room brawl it, well it's, the boiler it's room brawl uh, you have to remember that's their third pay-per-view match right mankind went three and0 against Undertaker <laughs> on pay-per-view um he won King of the Ring then buried alive, which was like the you know the big main event, and then, then SummerSlam, in the semi main, and now here we are the next month in September. Mick's only been here since April the first, and it's like September twenty second, and he's wrestling for the WWF title. That didn't happen very often. No, no, it didn't. And uh, the character that Mick Foley was able to create, you know, and Landon, you know, to your point, sort of in part with what he was doing to get into that character. Um, this is where like people love Mick Foley for the hardcore stuff. And I get it. But in terms of respect for a performer, this is the stuff that earns oh, yeah. the most praise from me. Like the most no like, pun intended. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did really enjoy just how dark mankind was in the first like, six to eight month period because he lightens up a little bit in 97 yeah that that last line of the opening package that that paul you referenced earlier that very last line is will the champion continue to live his dream or will he wake in this man's nightmare yeah loved it <laughs> so paul how did we get from SummerSlam to this match well the night after SummerSlam, it was announced that mankind is the number one contender for the WWE title and that's basically all the build we really get because they have very little interaction between each other other than some backstage interviews. There's a, there's a really fucking insane promo where Paul Bear and Mankind are in a boiler room and they're just like, Shawn Michaels, my Mankind is going to destroy you at my games. He won't be a sexy boy. He's not the boy toy, but he'll be the World Wrestling Federation champion. Oh, Paul Bearer's got a little bit of sweat on his brow. You're not used to saying that very often, are you? But it's very hot in this boiler room. And the action's going to heat up for you, Shawn Michaels. Oh, yes, it will. Oh, God. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Mick gets on the mic and he just starts... <laughs> Like shrieking and wailing, like I know the girls are gonna come after me. I'm gonna be a desirable individual. Uh, it, it's it's a it's an amazing promo. I mean, if, you, if you've ever seen like a traditional Cactus Jack promo, it's oh, that. But like so yeah, good. But he's yeah. shrieking a lot more, like even more than he did as Cactus Jack. And then you get a classic Paul Bearer. Speaking of promos, HBK's promo. Before this match is just bizarre, right? It's, it's strange. Uh, he implies that for the first time since becoming WWF champion, he's nervous. And Mankind is 
playing a lot of mind games, which, you know, <laughs> pay-per-view name. <laughs> he said uh, it. But he says he doesn't have a lot going on upstairs, <laughs> that's exactly which is just not true at all. And that's why he's going to be okay. Yeah, he's like, it's a good thing. Yeah, I'm not very smart. Mankind <laughs> isn't very smart. So he's gonna. Uh, no, he's talking about himself. Oh, that's right. I'm he, sorry. He's talking about himself. He's the like, hard the old kid <laughs> doesn't have a lot going on upstairs. So I'm not smart enough to be scared of mankind. Mind games. <laughs> Basically, uh, I'm not scared because I'm stupid. The heartbreak <laughs> kid. I'm actually 31. <laughs> I'm not a kid anymore. It's just. Not what you'd expect. No, and Shawn Michaels normally those pre-match interviews are normally really solid from HBK, right? Uh, but it's just super, super bizarre. <laughs> um, earlier in in the night, we get one from uh, Mankind and Paul, Paul Bearer. They're in the boiler room at at what at this point is the initial core state center, which would eventually become Wachovia, and then now the Wells Fargo Center. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but. Um, in that match, Kevin Kelly asks, um, which, by the way, Kevin Kelly in the boiler room is hilarious to me, but uh, Kevin Kelly <laughs> asks Mankind, what do you have in store for Shawn Michaels? And, you know, the short answer is misery and destiny. And I love that. Really yeah. good. That's great. Yeah, I love that. And, uh, you know, we were able to to listen to a little bit of Grilling JR because he talked about this match in detail. One of the things that JR was was very uh, keen on pointing out that I thought was fascinating was mankind had to work to be booed in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the opening match of this contest saw the Sandman attack Bradshaw with beer cans. This is an ECW crowd. <laughs> it is. 100%. It's, it's like Spencer said before, the mics went hot. The crowd was chanting ECW at the top of the show. Yeah, at the very beginning. And so... Mick Foley, Cactus Jack, beloved by the Philly fans, of course. So he knew he had to work hard to be booed in Philadelphia. And and here's the good news is that Shawn Michaels was as over in Philly as he was anywhere else. Oh, Absolutely. yeah, they loved mm-hmm. him here. Mm-hmm. So it, it just set up for what I thought was a really, really interesting sort of mini storyline there of, of Mick Foley being that good to still get that mankind character booed despite how much people love him there. Oh, yeah, they they didn't they wanted to cheer him, but he found ways to get boos. Yeah. Uh w- he did some really interesting things starting it off, mankind living up to the mind games name, played mind games by being transported oh. to the ring inside a casket. Uh it's actually a coffin. A a a, a, what did I say? You said a casket, which is fair because that's what commentary called it. But it's not a casket. <laughs> it looked like a casket to uh, me. It's a coffin. They're, they are different. So a casket is usually made of a metal and composite. It has bars on the side so it can be carried by pallbearers and it lines up. By into what? A her- pallbearers. Got it. Not Paul Bear, <laughs> Paul Bears, and it's also uh, you. It, you mean his wait name? Wait a minute. <laughs> his name is a pun. <gasps> yes. <laughs> Uh, and a coffin is typically... Oh, my God! <laughs> and uh, the coffin, which we see here, is usually carved out of wood and is shaped like a coffin. If you don't know what a coffin shape is, draw a diamond and cut the ends off. That's yeah. right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you have any casket versus coffin hot takes, you can send those right here at Last Match Cast on Twitter. We are here for all of those opinions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love they call it a casket. It is a coffin, which is funny because the very, very first casket match was a coffin match because <laughs> Undertaker carved a coffin for Kamala. <laughs> there, there but as you said, Landon, uh, the Druids escort the coffin to the ring, and wouldn't you know it, mankind is inside the coffin? And and then out comes Shawn Michaels. And there is just nothing quite like a Shawn Michaels 1996 pop from the crowd. What was really interesting is, uh, like many matches, I watched this one with Jen, and I don't think she had seen these old 95, 96 Shawn Michaels matches. She goes, oh, he's actually not ugly. Well, what? that brings me to a great point, and uh, we haven't had one of these in a few episodes, but it's time for me to bring up the last match standing sign of the night. <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Here we go. That's right. In the very front row, 
big yellow poster during Michael's entrance. Playgirls Man of the Year. That's oh, it. That's God. it. Posing with the belt. That's right. I've seen it. You've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> Shawn Michaels, you're just in a, a bunch of girly mags with the belt. You never beat me. Foley. <laughs> Sorry, that's uh, another eight months. Uh, Foley is, is, is absolutely incredible here, as we've already sort of uh, referenced in the pre-show. Uh, he's, he's sort of trying to carve out a space for himself, right? This is uncharted territory, uh, you know, a main event in a WWF pay-per-view, uh, although it is in Philadelphia. And, and Sean gives him every opportunity to do so. Foley exposes the concrete down at ringside. Oh, immediately. And Sean plants him on it, which is a rare sight for WWF fans at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So it is. it's just Shawn Michaels finding these creative ways to to sort of let Foley shine in his element. And so, and when I'm so sorry, Paul. Oh, you're good. Uh, when Sean is able to sort of toss mankind like head first onto that concrete floor, oh, it's disgusting. J, Jr. says, and I bet he liked it. Talking about mankind. Do you know what I mean? And there's some more evidence yeah. that happens a little bit later that leads me to believe that statement. Yes. So I went out of my way to view this match with the mindset of it's 1996 and this is not how main events were booked. No. Right. So it really wasn't. So typically a main event for the title in the WWF was stare down. Lock up, chain grapple. Not Mick Foley's going to do his clothesline over the top rope where they both tumble to the outside. It was unpredictable. I really liked how this match started. Yeah, agreed. It's not the way a WWF title match starts. And like, one of the things that happen with that sort of play with the mat on the outside is Shawn Michaels covers Mankind. Well, what's happening is Mankind is picking up the mat to move it. And while he's got the mat in his hands, Michael does a drop kick. Yeah. Which drops mankind to the floor with the mat over the top of him. Sean then takes advantage by like double stomps <laughs> on yeah. the mat. And and the reason I bring that up is because babyface Sean Michaels now has an edge. Oh yeah. Some would say he has grit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you did not. <laughs> he I did. I just had to. It's okay, we'll cut that. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> one thing I really do enjoy about this match, though, is in the opening exchanges, Vince McMahon goes out of his way to say, Mankind is not a gifted technical wrestler. He's a brawler. As he's saying this, Mick Foley gets a fucking waist lock, does a side headlock takedown, Shoots the half into a front face lock and then picks up Shawn Michaels into a hammer lock. Uh, HBK tries to make quick work of Foley. Uh, he hits his elbow and sets up for the sweet shin music less than five minutes into the match. And just Mick is going on and just throws his body out of the ring and, and is consoled by Uncle Paul on the outside. And I love that this happens because it leans into this implication that Shawn Michaels gave in his opening promo that he's nervous about this match, that he wants to put away Foley as quick as possible. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very realistic thing for him to do. It's a, it's a smart move for a guy with no brains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then perhaps the most interesting moment in the entire match happens. Shawn Michaels gets Irish whipped into the corner, and he jumps up as if he's going to hop behind Mick, but Mick's not there. Shawn then hops down, March on the other side of the ring. What the fuck are you doing? And then proceeds to punch the shit out of Mick, who then takes Sean down. And they start grappling. And you're asking yourself, what the fuck's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on here. So, as you both know, because I've made you watch SummerSlam 96, there are several us. times where Vader blew a spot in that match and Sean blew a gasket. Mick knew that even if he got himself booed, this crowd was just going to be chanting ECW. They're going to they're going to hijack the match. So he thought, "What if I intentionally blow a spot and piss off Sean? That'll pull the crowd in because they're not going to be paying, they're going to be like, oh, they're going to fight for real." He got him wow. because Sean blew a fucking gasket and walked over and started fighting. 
and Mick is, you can hear all the commentary because Vince goes, oh, this, this is not what we're expecting to see out of these two. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> then, oh, man, Sean's really firing up now. Yeah, he is. Look at those punches. He's not pulling them. He's hitting Mick full force. And that's what Mick wanted. I mean, he could, he's, he loves that. He can take that. Well, I mean, he did wrestle Vader for three years. Uh, another great bit of storytelling we get here is exactly what Michaels was worried about, right? How do you wrestle someone as unpredictable as Mankind? When Michaels goes for a snapmare, Mankind grabs him from behind and just falls backwards. Yep. Like trying to lock in the mandible claw all in the process. A very unorthodox counter from the labyrinthian mind of Mankind. And at this point, that's what this match has become, a battle of the minds. Oh, yeah, and I love how many set up for later payoffs they have because they start to kind of brawl towards the announce table. They, it gets moved, and then Sean leaps over it before doing a suplex onto the, the ring stairs. And damn it, I love Mick Foley. But every time he does this spot, I just want to go, stop. Don't do that spot. Because I know you've got bad knees because of it. Oh, Man, that suplex just on the opposite end of the casket coffin. Coffin. Uh, <laughs> where, I mean, Foley's leg just perfectly catches the corner of the steps. It is Oh, it's disgusting. Nasty. What I, what I think is interesting is that they start bumping towards the coffin, and I'm thinking, in just under a year and a half, Sean, your career is going to be over because of a coffin bump. Oh. Don't love yeah, that. Yeah, that's uncomfortable to yeah, think Yeah, don't about. love that. Uh, but after this suplex onto the steps, Michaels, you know, kind of to the point of uh, it's becoming a mind game, has a target now and oh, shifts yeah. his strategy to attack the legs of mankind going as far as putting him into a figure four leg lock, which I always just appreciate. It's like the showstopper figure four. Woo. The problem <laughs> you know is Earl loved it. Uh, the problem is whatever kind of pain Sean could possibly inflict on a mankind's legs pales in comparison to what mankind would willfully inflict upon himself as evidence when his leg starts to hurt him from Sean's offense, Mankind grabs a pencil and just starts sitting on the apron, stabbing, stabbing himself up. repeatedly in the leg. Well, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to numb it. What could Sean possibly do now? What do you do to that? Nothing. It's mind games. You know what you do? You get frustrated and you slap the shit out of Earl Hebner. What the fuck was up with that? I don't know, but I'm like... This is like clearly I, these mind games are working. And I love that because JR goes, referees on a lot of things slide right now. <laughs> because then a chair gets brought into it. And they start hitting with a chair on the outside. And I'm like, this is not no DQ, guys. That chair is illegal. Uh, uh, Sean rips a bar off the chair and throws it to the crowd. And I'm like, what is going on? I do have to say this match suffers a tiny bit. Uh, by following Goldust versus The Undertaker. Oh, uh, not because fuck. that was a better match, uh, but because after the glitter that Goldust had left in, the, in and around the ring, these guys look like they're next up to perform with the Chippendales. <laughs> well, I mean, Sean is wearing all black. I mean, put a, put a collar on him, and he's ready to go. Yeah. And he did the strip tease at the beginning. Uh, you know, Paul, you, you mentioned the, the chair work on the outside while Paul Bearer is distracting Earl Hebner, but the way they get to the outside in that moment is a surprising one. And it's a scary one uh, because what happens is um, mankind is, you know, sort of being thrown out of the ring um, towards the announce tables and he gets caught in the ropes. The fucking hangman spot. That's how he lost his ear. That not in this match. Right. But like he lost his ear in the hangman spot. It's just one of those things that, you know, I've seen it before, whatever. Every time I see it, there's an audible, like, gasp out of me. That just feels like that should not be happening. No. Like, surely 
he's going to seriously get injured. And there's already so much body horror going on throughout this match. This was just one step beyond. And and it's almost it was as if it, it looked like it was intentional, right? Because if you think about what oh, the happens. Hangman? Yeah. Yeah, he loved doing that. Well, no, I mean like the character even. You know, and mm-hmm. so it's like mm-hmm. mankind is going to set himself up in this thing that looks terrifying and bait well, you, you, Shawn say, Michaels right, toward he, him because he, baits him he immediately locks the mandible claw in. As soon as Shawn gets there, he locks in the mandible claw. And so it's like, holy shit, this guy just did it to himself. It, it was genius. Well, it goes back to that labyrinth of mankind's mind, right? Like you had referenced. And, you know, this match more than anything else, is a master class in ring psychology. Two characters, I mean, and I, I don't, mind games, you know, whatever. But seriously, that's what it is. You know, with two athletes that are known for sort of being, you know, either this, this high-profile performer like Shawn Michaels or this hardcore, dangerous one like Mankind, that's not what this match is about. This match is no. about what they're able to portray as characters. Yeah. And push a story forward, and they do it impeccably. And it wouldn't be a Shawn Michaels match without getting the turned inside out in the turnbuckle. But he comes down to the tree of woe. And I love that it's the perfect setup for mankind's patented mm-hmm. diving elbow to the corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he starts biting Michaels' forehead before ripping his own hair out. And there's a part where I think <laughs> JR just goes. Shawn Michaels may be concussed. Mankind, well, I don't really know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and I think we're talking about how well uh, a Mankind is playing these mind games, but Shawn Michaels wisens up, right? We talked about the uh, the, the needs of Mick Foley. Uh, well, Michaels goes over to the outside and purposefully sets himself up, leaning up against the steel steps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. baiting in Mick Foley to run at him and moves away at the last second and boom the 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 running knee spot yeah just it's a Mick Foley staple uh but the fact that it looks so intentional right mm-hmm. here as as a bait by Shawn Michaels I really appreciate it that's when we get our very first unbelievable by Vince McMahon <laughs> <laughs> let's just take a moment yeah uh Vincent Kennedy McMahon is at his worst on commentary. Oh, here. yeah. Unfortunately so. I mean, Jesus, God. It's just... JR is really good, you know, when he's able to get a word in. Mr. Perfect barely gets a chance to talk um, because Vince is just... And he, he, and he reaches that point where he's yelling and you almost can't understand what he's saying because he's way up here. Well, I, th- I think the problem is that Vince didn't like the match. I think he thought it was probably too violent. Probably thought it was pushing the envelope too much. Uh, same problem we had with WrestleMania 13 in Hart and Austin, where Vince didn't like it because it was too much. So he's like, oh, man, you don't always see this in the Royal Wrestling Federation because we're never going to do this ever again. Both of these <laughs> men are going to be... <laughs> he God, did say God that. God damn it, stop it, stop it. And just at the fever pitch of Vince McMahon getting frustrated, Mick Foley goes for a backdrop off the top rope, and Sean turns it to a cross by the last second to destroy, utterly destroy the Spanish announce table. Holy shit. That was not a gimmick table, and they fucking destroyed it. Yeah, and that is just something that you just did not see up until this point and has almost become a a staple, like I alluded to at the beginning of the episode, in, in pro wrestling matches, or at least, you know, there was a time period where pretty much every main event pay-per-view match saw a Spanish table. announce table yeah. be broken some way. But those were gimmicks. This was not a gimmick table. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, a beautiful, beautiful moment, and and it was a it was after mankind had hit a double underhook DDT. He'd hit a pile driver, yeah. both of which Michaels kicked out of, and so it was mankind trying to go that next step, go that one step further to put Michaels away because he couldn't do it with those other things, and so he's going for that sort of back suplex off the turnbuckle through the table. Michaels reverses it, like Paul said, with the crossbody. And this is sort of as we get into the closing moments of the contest. Yeah. Um, what ends up happening is uh, Mankind has to try to get back into the ring. He climbs up towards that top turnbuckle um, again. 
and some chairs were thrown into the ring earlier by Mankind. And Paul, earlier you mentioned how much you appreciated that they set things up early oh, in the match yeah. that comes back to haunt them. And it's like, why did they throw two chairs in the ring earlier? Who knows? Well, <laughs> But you find out because Michaels uses one chair to leap towards Mankind, who's on the top turnbuckle, who is holding the other chair to get a sweet chin music into the chair, into his face. Unbelievable. Very uh, Rob Van Dam-esque, of course, later Before down the Rob line. Before Rob Van Dam mm-hmm. was doing those kind of things. Mm-hmm. So a big deal. Big, big deal. Um, Mankind, of course, falls off the turnbuckle at that point. Shawn Michaels goes for the cover. Immediately stops c- cover. Because, oh man, there's Vader! He starts throwing hands with Vader. Man, cut! Shawn Michaels and Vader! Oh, there comes Psycho Sid! What's this game ever going to end? Oh my gosh, this match has been the most. I counted. <laughs> You know how they'll do like the seven or eight bell rings with oh, DQ? Oh, yeah. I love that. Ten times. Unashamed. I just love when it's like, we're going to ring the bell to make you stop. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> they didn't stop ringing why the damn bell. Working? I don't know why it doesn't work. The bell kept ringing for a good two minutes. Like, stop ringing the bell. And then finally, after Vader comes out, Psycho Sid comes out, him and Vader start brawling. Paul Bear hits Sean and Michael's the back of the head with, with, the, with the urn. And then him and Mankind are going to go put Shawn Michaels in the in the coffin. And, oh, The Undertaker rises out of the fucking coffin. And I'm like, how did you get him in there? And, and that's what's so interesting is we've noticed several times throughout the match, the coffin has been opened. Yes. Like, at one point, Mick Foley's just like, oh, you know, I'm going to put Shawn in the oh, coffin. Put him in there, yeah. You know, it, it, my it games, up. hello. Uh, and it opens up, and he gets in there, but he doesn't. It doesn't close. You know, the lid doesn't close or no, anything. Sean what is he stepping on on Undertaker in there? Like, how the fuck did they do this? I don't know. But when he rises from that coffin, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Because the next month at Survivor Series, it's the Undertaker versus Mankind. That's the one where the Undertaker descends from the rafters with bat wings. He looks like Fabio, but he's wearing all black. He's got his hair like pulled back. It's braided. He looks like Fabio. Imagine, imagine Goth Fabio with his with his teardrop tattoo. Goth Fabio, I. Gothio. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> the Finabio. <laughs> Playgirls Man of the Year. <laughs> so yeah, so Survivor Series. It is Undertaker versus Mankind for the fourth time. Shawn Michaels versus Psycho Sid. Which is really strange, considering it looked like he was going to have to face Vader, Vader or something, right? No, I don't even think Vader has a match in that card. Um, so this is a point worth talking about. This match ends in disqualification. It might be the f- the first match on our list that ends in disqualification. I think it is. Uh, we've we've obviously had some draws, you know, things like that. But this match does not have a clean finish. Um, which, as Jr. would say, is kind of like a kiss your sister kind of ending which i never understood what the fuck that was supposed to mean it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't help <laughs> so sorry. i'm sorry it doesn't help JR line in there. it doesn't help that uh it, it's an awkward end because michaels has to get up from the cover instead of the cover being stopped uh because vader's not in the ring yet yeah, he misses q I think. uh and and so like that doesn't look great necessarily because no. why would Michaels just not finish the pin to win the match? Well, I mean, he still has to go bury Vader from last month. He's not done embarrassing him on pay-per-view. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I think we'll, when we get to ranking, we'll talk about how much that may or may not affect the, th- the deal here. Um, but overall, in your house, 10 mind games. I mean, this is the match that, in my opinion, at the very least, doesn't get enough attention. No, not at all. I mean... The ending is what it is. I did thoroughly enjoy how insanely overbooked it was, having three dist- having three run-ins with a DQ. Uh, I mean, where are we here? Are we at the zoo, at the barbecue store? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sneaking so, old JR line. So the, the match ends in disqualification, whatever. Uh, this match proved that Mick Foley could work a great technical bout. Yep. And it solidified Michaels as a fighting champion, 
even against the greatest of odds. But, you know, we don't like DQ finishes, but you know what the DQ finish does? It protects Sean and Mick. It, You know, it's a lazy way to do it, but it does. It is, but if Sean just beats Mick, well, then he's got no more heat. And, and there's a reason it's the only DQ finish on our list, because... It does hurt this match's ranking. I'm not going to lie. But it, it does. doesn't hurt either wrestler. But it doesn't hurt either either wrestler. It's one of the best matches out of both guys. It's just, it's so hard not to sort of overlook that. I can whistle past it based on the performance that we got from these guys in this match. Yeah, that that's a, a great, great point. Because ha- on face value, like just on paper, if you would have said, hey, the next match on our, on our show is going to be ends in DQ, I'd have said, we're not covering it. They're like, it's... Duh. Like, why would we do that? <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right. There's so much that happens in the other 25 minutes of this match that make it worth it. Mick Foley has called this the greatest match of his career, which is high praise, to say the least. Mm-hmm. Wow. And and like we said earlier, to consider this in, in one of Shawn Michaels' bests ever uh, says a whole lot because that guy was not bad at what he did. You know, so... Uh, I, I'm really interested to to rank it, but I want to hear favorite moments first. So is anything specific stands out to you? Uh, here? This is gonna—it's a very very simple one. We we passed over it, but Shawn Michaels trying to break Mick's hand so he can't do the mandible claw. Yes, I really love that, Paul. Uh, I was going to say that is there were moments where where Shawn Michaels uh, uh, uh kind of shows some some frustration, and he's like, okay. I never want to be put in the mandible claw ever again. That fucking sucked. Let me do some joint manipulation. Let me stomp on his hand. You know, the, and you just don't you don't see that a whole lot from from Sean. Oh no, so it was it was really really yeah. good. I like that too. I, I There's agree. a lot of things you didn't normally see from him. You saw in this match that kind of became staples of his uh, in ring style. Yeah, uh, I, I just a, a quick little shout out to Mister Perfect who didn't get much you know words in edgewise here on commentary, but. Uh, you know, Michaels at one point after the figure four is still attacking the legs. And so he does this sort of like a uh, knee drop onto the legs, almost has his own legs in a, in a figure four leg lock sort of with just a single leg on, on mankind. And uh, Mr. Perfect says that was one of my moves he used right there, which means that Shawn Michaels is wrestling this match perfectly. perfectly. I love uh, that. So good. Uh, you know, you can't help it. It's just phenomenal stuff. Uh, but guys i think that leads us to for the 69th time we have to rank this match on our list of the greatest wrestling matches of all time nose goes given the fact <laughs> oh okay that there was a dq finish yeah my floor is going to be low and that's you know obviously no knock off of what they've done it's just there are some incredible finely put together masterpiece that we've determined uh, spots for on this list. And when the ending leaves the glaring hole, what are you going to do? You put it number 50. Um, so that, that being said, Paul's already said 50. <laughs> uh, that being said, it still accomplishes more than the bottom several matches of our list so far. I would say it's at the very least better than Gail Kim versus awesome Kong at 62. Um, Ceiling, uh, maybe given the incredible storytelling throughout the match, uh, you know, the crowd eating up everything Michaels and Foley are giving them, I would be comfortable placing this over Rock Hogan at 52. I don't know how much higher I would go, personally. Okay, so that puts you 52 to 62 is sort of your range at this point. Okay, okay. Paul, you said 50 earlier. You you stick with that or any, any range there? I mean, 50 to 55. I don't know. Uh, just highly justified, super there. committable, oh, yeah. uh, super committing. I like it. And that, and that, like that, that five number range right there. Oh, okay. Um, I, I feel similarly. Um, the the ending does dock it, unfortunately. Um, but it was so good leading up to that. Yeah, the psychology of this match cannot be understated. It's uh, off the charts. It is. It absolutely is. And and so, you know, it, it's. It's very, very easy for me to compare it to the other Mankind and Michael's matches on our list. I tried not to do that, mainly because the only other Mankind match we have is Hell in a Cell. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, like, the other Shawn, some of the other Shawn and Michael's matches, well, they don't have DQ finishes. 
but there the the point I was getting to was that there is a a match that is actually in between two Mick Foley matches. Uh, sitting at number forty two is Cactus Jack and Triple H. Sitting at forty four is Edge and Mick Foley. In between that is a match that feels like it's got all the psychology in the world, which reminds me of this one, and that is Liger and Muda. And so that is my the comparison point. Uh, I, I did think about that match too. Yeah. I think that match does more specifically because of the finish, but also because it, it, it just reminds me of this a lot because they're two characters that have to grow over the course oh my of a, God. Of a the, match. These matches are only like a month apart. Yeah, oh yeah, no, they are they're very, very uh, close in the time frame, which tells you, again, that there was good stuff happening outside of the WWF in 1996. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say there wasn't. I mean, the right. NWO uh, the biggest thing in the world. So my point is is that that would have been my ceiling was Liger and Muda at 43. That would have been top, you know, like as high as it could go. And as far as a floor, um, I was looking around 54, right in between Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn and right above Survivor Series, Austin and Bischoff. Mm-hmm. So that's Started where... Started here in Dallas. Yeah, so that's where I stand, 44 to 54. Yeah, and I, I'm definitely going to stick kind of around the 50 to 52 range. I think it would be where I was most comfortable with this one. I mean, it's it's a shame that the DQ does sort of, uh, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, but... Like you said, the the psychology of the match uh, just cannot be overstated. Yeah, just looking at our at our sort of ranges here, um, it looks like our sweet spot is somewhere between fifty two and fifty four, or fifty five. Um, I think fifty four is a good sweet spot. Fifty four would put it right below RBD and Jerry Lynn, right above Austin and Bischoff. Uh, fifty three would put it above Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn, right below Rock Hogan. And if we go above Rock Hogan, it would be right under Jones and Rocco. Uh, so how do we feel about a specific spot here in this sort of 50 to 55 range? I like 54. I'm okay with putting it immediately below uh, Jones Rocco. That's the highest that I would put it. Mm-hmm. 52? So, well, let's just... That's a good number. Let's compare. Mankind, Michaels, in your house versus... Rock Hogan WrestleMania. Yeah, what's the better match? Well, Rock and Hogan has a better crowd. This crowd's really good. This crowd's great. Well, this crowd is much smaller. I mean, uh, no, but but you don't have Icon versus Icon. I get that. Mm-hmm. You uh, have it's, the it's Icon. Totally no, different. Tr- you have the Icon versus the Hardcore Legend. Mm-hmm. You do. Uh, Showstopper. But, but keeping in mind where they were in their careers at this point, it's, it's sort of different. Oh, no, Mick's already the hardcore legend at this point. Oh, well, well that, that's true. That's and Sean, true. Uh, is Sean the Showstopper yet? I think that comes in 97, actually. It's one of the hardest comparisons you can think of. They're just night and day matches. Yeah. They try and accomplish different things. 20, they were booked for different reasons. 22 years apart. Complete different shows. Uh, I would watch this match again before Rock Hogan. I would do. It's a better match. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I love it, and it's not just me being nostalgic and going, I love this match. No, it's good. Now, it, I get goosebumps every time I watch Rock Hogan. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but if I'm looking, for, if I'm going looking for a wrestling match that I'm going to show somebody and be like, dude, you need to watch this match, it's going to be this one. The oh, s- yeah. The story and the psychology that Michaels and Mankind put on in this match Incredible. is second to none on our list almost, right? Uh, and so for me, that's what would put it over Rock Hogan. Agreed. Um, so I that's that's where I think I end up is 52. 52. Is that good? It's a good number. I like it. I like it. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, Shawn Michaels versus Mankind at In Your House Mind Games for the WWF Championship is the 52nd greatest wrestling match of all time. With a better ending, it might be 22. Great point. Yeah, really, really could have uh, climbed much, much higher on this list had that been the case. But let us know what you think, you listener out there. What What do you think on a list of 69 of the best ever? Uh, where does Mind Games fall for you? Um, if you agree with us, love that. Let us know at Last Match Cast on Facebook or Twitter. If you disagree with us, 
also fine. Let us know on Twitter and Facebook at Paul T. Altazan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, Lord Paul Lee on Twitter. Yep. Uh, but we've got so much left here in Season 4. It's only going to go uh, get better from here. And don't forget, our next episode, Episode 70, is going to be the second half of our Hebner doubleheader. That's right. So be ready for that. Uh, and, and I would like to also say that someone involved in this match might make another appearance there exactly. in episode 70 outside of they, Earl Hebner. They might be the fourth person to be double duty on a podcast. Until well said. Until episode 70. I'm Spencer. I'm Paul. I'm Landon. And this is Last, Last Match, Match Standing. Standing. This is a perfect